behalf of uh, Cornell University and the Office of Alumni Affairs and Development, I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you tonight. I apologize, I am recovering from a cold, so bear with me. I am here to uh, give a wonderful welcome to our very special guests, but prior to that, I would like to highlight a couple of special people in the room. Some of, our, um, some of my colleagues um, have traveled from Philadelphia and all the way from Ithaca. So I'll just ask that our staff members please stand and, and wave and say hello. Tracy Bosberg, Carolyn Caswell, Julie Waters, Lauren Chalmers, and Maureen Newman. And throughout the evening and after this event, please feel free to ask uh, any one of us any questions that, you know, that you may have. My name is Lori Brogdon. I currently serve as Associate Director of Regional Programs I'm in the Office of Alumni Affairs and Development. And this evening, I am giving a wonderful welcome to our Vice President for University Communications, Tommy Bruce. Oh, <laughs> can I stop? <laughs> no, no, please, please. <laughs> Tommy Bruce served as Vice this is, President this is overseeing the start. Division of University Communications with a staff of 85 organized in four critical areas of news, marketing, public affairs and campus relations. In addition, Bruce has a formal relationship with each of the communications directors of each of Cornell's 13 colleges and schools. His primary responsibilities on behalf of the university include leading the development of its communication strategy and practices, serving as the university's spokesperson to all media and to the public, directing all aspects of its marketing activities, including the design and maintenance of the website, news services, publication services, and photography, as well as overseeing the information and visitor services. Bruce's 30 years in the nation's capital encompass policy making on Capitol Hill, foreign policy, diplomacy, and international consulting. He brings to Cornell a wide array of experience in creating and managing large-scale advocacy campaigns in the areas of international and domestic business, politics, and public policy. Please welcome Tommy Bruce. Thank you very th can, can you hear me right now? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to thank you for such a generous introduction. Uh, actually, um, I'm really here today because uh, this, is, this uh, event and this whole day is part of a, uh, an effort that we're, uh, we're undertaking to uh, dramatically scale up the visibility of Cornell and most especially our thought leaders uh, across campus to, to bring them to Washington and to other uh, parts of the country to engage them with uh, folks so that um, we can start having an increasing and ongoing conversation uh, in this case with Washington. So today I'm very happy to be with uh, three of our faculty colleagues. They've, they've had a long day, so I treat them nicely. Uh, they've been handled by the press. They've met with the press at noon, and then they spent some time on Capitol Hill uh, um, um, making presentations uh, to folks in the S Senate offices, and I believe some, some folks from the House side. And uh, so this is part of this effort of ours, and so let me just, uh, I, uh, the, the, the subject tonight is really chemical exposure in everyday life. Now, uh, those of us who are from another, from another time, uh, we used to think of chemicals as a good thing. Uh, those are things that bring value to our lives. And here we are today with a panel of, we want to talk to you about things that are, are uh, to, to shine a light, if you will, on the urgency and the need to tackle um, uh, these issues here in Washington. So we're very fortunate to have um, uh, uh, Associate Professor Anthony Hay from, uh, from the College of uh, uh, Agriculture and Life Sciences, the Department of Microbiology. He is uh, an eco-toxicologist. Toxi Toxicologist, that's a big word for me. And, um, <laughs> and he specializes on the fate of pollutants, right? Mm -hmm. In the environment and uh, how the, their effects on human on humans, and we, he is going to be uh, joined by Motoko Mukai, who is uh, from the College of Veterinary Medicine, 
and uh, her expertise is on persistent pollutants and their effects. And I, I, I saw a little bit of her presentation earlier today, and I think she has some things uh, that are uh, slightly alarming. Um, and uh, <laughs> so we will turn to her for urgency, for a sense of urgency. And then, of course, uh, I'm delighted to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Margaret Frey, who's from the College of Human Ecology. Her expertise in fiber science. And um, uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think you'll be very interested by her presentation as well. So one of the things before I turn the microphone over to, to our guests, I'll come back after each has made a presentation and, and sort of help moderate the conversation. But I'm going to very quickly turn to you and ask you to, get, uh, to, you to ask questions and to engage in the conversation. I want to, before, uh, uh, before we get into that, I, however, I think it would be really appropriate to kind of draw your attention to the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Futures. Um, they've, uh, Lauren Chambliss, who, who uh, was recognized earlier, is here with us and has been part of this effort today to, um, to uh, uh, um, introduce our colleagues to uh, folks on Capitol Hill. Uh, the, the center, as you know, plays a, a really uh, critical role in, um, in uh, uh, f uh, encouraging collaborations and research among the 300 or so faculty members who are, inv who are involved in one way or another across all the colleges, <coughs> but are involved in issues uh, affecting sustainability. So this is to, uh, one of our ways of um, increasing that collaboration, increasing that kind of research. And um, so uh, just a shout out for the center and for all that it does. Um, so but without any uh, further ado, maybe we could just, so five minute conversation, could you first introduce yourselves? Uh, tell us why you are in this field. I, I would love to hear your personal experiences that sort of brought you here and uh, what are you working on right now? So sure. Anthony, would you like to be the sure. go first? Sure, I'd love to. I, I hope you don't mind if I do a shout out for the Atkinson Center as well. Um, the Atkinson Center has funded research that many of us are involved with, and I'm currently involved, in one of the projects I'm involved with is uh, looking at sand dune movement in Qatar. And it was really the foresight of the Atkinson Center with a small $6,000 grant that allowed us to get to Qatar and to develop some preliminary data. We were then around, able to turn that around into now our second million dollar grant from the Qatar National Research Foundation. So bringing people together with different expertise is, is one of the things that the Atkinson Center does very well. This is how I first actually got introduced to Margaret's research by, by a small award to, to work with one of her collaborators. And so for me, uh, the Atkinson Center you know, really has been a very catalytic um, uh, entity in, in helping to promote research uh, in, in my own discipline. So why am I here? Why are you here? I mean, do you ever wonder, you know, what is it that got you here? Um, when I was on sabbatical in 2010, the um, Deepwater Horizon uh, fiasco happened in the Gulf. And I remember you know, very vividly seeing these images of, of burning oil rigs. And for me, it was a very much a full circle experience because as a sophomore, I, I remember coming home um, and sitting down at my mom's coffee table and there was a, a, a National Geographic and on the cover was something about the Exxon Valdez. So it was a bird covered in oil. And as I flipped through the pages, I remember you know, coming across this section about novel strategies for cleaning up environmental pollution. And one of them was bioremediation. And so bioremediation was this idea that they could use natural microorganisms to help clean up pollutants. And that was really, I have to point at that one incident and say, that's when it clicked with me, that there was something I could do that was science related, that was environmentally responsible, and that would allow me to perhaps make a contribution. And so even though I haven't actually worked on oil products, um, through the years, really, I've been working on using microorganisms to degrade pollutants, what I call bugs on drugs. So we focus more on things like ibuprofen and triclosan, uh, hand, so hand detergents and, and things like that. But trying to understand how microorganisms are involved in um, affecting the concentration of these things out in the environment, their fate, what actually happens to them. In some cases, microorganisms do a great job of detoxifying pollutants and getting rid of them. In other cases, sometimes the gut microorganisms in our own intestines can actually activate a compound and make it more toxic. So for me, this is, these are some of the areas where I'm focused on. The, the Cutter Project is a, is a little different 
in the sense that there we're using microbial activity to try and stabilize dunes. So we're looking at the impact of microbes that are growing on surfaces or biofilms and how they might be harnessed to, to, uh, to stabilize dunes so that we reduce airborne particulates and, and prevent uh, really the, the swallowing of ground-based infrastructure. These dunes are incredible. Some of them are over 600 feet high and there's just a steady, relentless march of dunes. Um, so that's the research that um, at Atkinson Center helped to, to, to spur and that we're currently involved in. So uh, as director of the Institute for Comparative Environmental Toxicology, I'm involved in looking at pollutants and, and trying to pull together faculty to, to tackle some of these difficult subjects. And it's really a, a great opportunity to interact with people across the Cornell University. There's faculty in more than seven colleges that are involved in the Institute for Comparative Environmental Toxicology. And it's really a pleasure to work with you know, people from material science like Margaret Frey to people in the vet school like Motoko to people in engineering uh, like Michelle Luge who I work with there. And so uh, I really think that Cornell is just one of the best places in the world to do the type of research that I do. It's just it's a great multidisciplinary collaborative environment and I'm just pleased to be here. Thank you. Toga, would, would you like to go next, please? Sure. Um, so I am originally from Japan, and the reason why I got um, interested in toxicology was when I was a veterinary student, I think it was the second year, this book called Our Stolen Future came out. It's a, a very famous book. It's, um, you probably are familiar with Silent Spring, but this was the next Silent Spring kind of book, and it really affected me. And so I started this uh, research project on uh, looking at effects in utero and lactational exposure to PCB. So when the, um, if the mother is a uh, 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 rodent or exposed to, the female rodent is exposed to PCB, what kind of effect does it have on the uh, offspring? That was the kind of a research I was doing as an undergraduate <coughs> student or a veterinary student. And then I got more and more interested in endocrine disruptors. So I decided to go um, get a PhD and came to the US and studied, uh, got my PhD degree in uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And um, I've been in this field ever since. So uh, my main interest in research is looking at toxicological effect in um, endocrine disruptors. And it has been up to now, uh, specifically on dioxin and coplanar PCBs. And uh, during my postdoc, uh, I decided to study migratory birds because I thought being a veterinarian, I thought uh, migratory birds would be a very interesting model to look at toxicological effects of endocrine disruptors and not, a bear, not very many people were working in that area. So I worked for a um, researcher named John Wingfield. He's a, a assistant directorate for the NSF right now for biological sciences but he was at UC Davis at the time, and so we um, did some microarray studies to look at gene expression at the hypothalamus level in the brain to see what kind of regulation are going in there at the uh, brain level uh, when uh, these birds are exposed to length, uh, longer day length. So, and we found some genes that are, uh, uh, that affects the thyroid hormone system affected. So my hypothesis is that some of these endocrine disruptors that affects the thyroid could affect that uh, mechanism of birds responding to light and therefore uh, prepare for migration. And these birds start, as soon as the day, um, if you bring them into captivity and expose them to lengthening of light, they start eating drastically. And they get hyperphagic and they get fat and they're ready for migration. And they tr start to, uh, move around, become very active during the nighttime, uh, whereas uh, the specific birds that I was looking at is not uh, diurnal, so they're not supposed to be moving around at night. But as soon as they're ready for migration, they fly at night, so they start moving. So I was studying that effect. Um, so I would like to look at the endocrine disrupting effects of, um, in that process. Uh, in the future, but at the moment, I have a project uh, which is funded by Atkins Center, and uh, I'm working with the zebrafish embryo model to look at effects of endocrine disruptors and uh, complex mixture. And this, uh, this proposal was on hydrofracking because when I arrived at Cornell in 2011, in January, 
I went to a seminar by Susan Reha, who works at the, um, who's a director of uh, Water Research Institute, and she gave a presentation about hydrofracking. I said, whoa, this is really, you know, a concern for people around Ithaca and upstate New York, and what can I do as a toxicologist? And I went up to her right after her, our talk and said, have you been looking at any components of this water if there's a contamination? And she said, not yet, but we would like to look. So that's how the collaboration started. And we um, were collaborating with Todd Walter at the um, wa uh, water and soil testing water lab, wa water and soil testing lab. And we're uh, getting some baseline data. Um, and we are not sure if hydrofracking will ever come to New York State, but we're getting ready to, uh, if there ever will, um, so that we have some baseline data for that. And uh, another Atkins Center supported project is um, looking at pesticide load level in uh, uh, local mason bees. Uh, this is a work in collaboration with Brian Danforth and the entomology, Department of Entomology. And we uh, think that their interaction of susceptibility to pathogen and uh, residual levels of pesticides in these um, mason bees. So. I'm really thankful for Atkins Center supporting this project. Sounds like you're very busy. Can you send me <laughs> some gut content? So we can do the microbiology. Oh, that would be very yeah. interesting, yeah. Just excuse us while we do <laughs> we, have, we have a grant to write. This is what it's all about. This is very good. Um, Margaret. Hi, I'm Margaret Frey. I'm from the Department of Fiber Science and Apparel Design in the College of Human Ecology. Um, I can't help but notice that everyone in the audience has chosen to wear clothing made of fibers today. So I know <laughs> that you are all my people and you all know about the kinds of materials that I like to work with. Um, a lot, although, you know, many people think of textiles as sort of an old fashioned, low tech kind of material. And it is something that people have been using for 3,000 or more years, but have never been able to really replace. Um, the flexibility, the strength, the breathability, the ability to absorb and move fluids in fibers um, is unique over other kinds of materials, metals, plastics, um, ceramics, things like this. So in my research, I take this, uh, these properties of fibers really to an extreme. And I make fibers that are hundreds of times finer than a human hair. I design these to uh, capture and, and move and sort out um, things like E. coli, uh, salmonella, viruses, and different kinds of chemicals. And while these guys are finding out that uh, these kinds of chemicals are prevalent in our environment now, what I'm really working on is building rapid, easy ways to detect these things. So the goal is maybe something that's like a home pregnancy test that really any person with, with no education you know, can go and get and use and test to find out if um, they're subject to a disease or if toxins are present in their water or in their food or in their environment. So uh, that's what we're working on in fiber science and apparel design. Well, thank you. So um, just to, uh, so to share a little bit your experience today, I mean, you came, all three of you, you're very busy, you have a lot of things to do, but you came to Washington. And what, what was the message that brought the three of you together? And what did you tell people on Capitol Hill, for example, that they should be paying attention to? And I think you want to take a, sure. and, I, and I invite everybody to interrupt each other and join the conversation. Great. Uh, really, it's an opportunity to talk to, folks on Capitol Hill and, and also to the journalists and to you fine folks about uh, the opportunity that we have, a rather unique opportunity in this very polarized political and climate to, uh, to support a bipartisan effort to revamp the um, Toxic Substances Control Act. So it's often um, abbreviated as TOSCA, uh, uh, not like the opera, is that? It sounds like is an opera. Yeah, no, no, no. I, don't know my, I don't know my opera very, very well. Um, but, um, huh. But the song that we're singing is one that encourages this effort, in, in especially in a way to empower the EPA to actually do the job that um, the current legislation has asked it to do, but has made it impossible for it to accomplish. So the legislation that was written in 1976, when you know, the world was a slightly different place, uh, the Cuyahoga River was burning, 
Um, you know, there now the biggest problem with the Cuyahoga is that carp are trying to get into Lake Michigan. Is that where they're going? Erie. Lake Erie. Sorry, I my geography's off. Um, <laughs> but so the the idea that you know we're no longer necessarily confronted with these acute doses of toxins that are killing people or creating obvious birth defects uh, or causing high rates of cancer, the, the effects that we're seeing and that toxicologists are concerned with are much more subtle. So Matoko talked about endocrine disruption. Uh, behavioral changes, there is a, anyone was watching CNN this afternoon, there was a study released from a group by Harvard that looked at air, air pollution and metals on the rates of autism. Uh, so subtle effects on learning disabilities, and these are the things that the pr current legislation really doesn't grapple with very well and doesn't provide EPA the resources, both financial resources, but also the regulatory law creating resources um, or power to, to create um, guidance and um, statutory, or sorry, regulatory limits on, on pollutants that are protective of human and environmental health. So that's the, the, the message that I was here to, to share with them that really it's, it's about creating legislation that's good for business, that's good for the environment, and that provides a level of certainty for both business and the public about how we can improve our, our own health. Uh, Matuko, I remember at, at lunchtime you, um, you were talking about the urgency of the situation and you had some statistics that were, you had a couple, couple data points that were interesting. One was uh, something like 28,000 chemicals that we use and 700 are introduced every new year. I may, I may have gotten that wrong, but I remember the, order, the numbers, the order of magnitude was really impressive. And the other thing that I, so, so I'd love you to talk a little bit about that. And, and the, another aspect of it was this uh, idea of additive versus synergistic and how actually you're also interested in how things interact, how these chemicals and these compounds are interacting among, them, among themselves and causing further damage. Can you give us a little sense of why now there should be more urgency? So, um, well, I, I think it, there, it's not specifically now, but we, we are beginning to understand that these compounds, toxic compounds, or any compounds, can have these additive and synergistic effect. Which, um, so I started out by talking about effects of endocrine disruptor and how very low levels of a compound can have subtle effect. But there's also a problem of we live in a world where we're immersed in cocktails and mixtures, uh, cocktails of chemicals. And right now we have more than 84,000 chemicals registered. and an average of 700 more is added every year, but very small fraction of those compounds are really tested for safety or uh, toxicological effects. And we don't know how many of those have endocrine disrupting effects. So I wanted to talk about, uh, talk about it today to um, uh, let the, legis uh, the, the policy makers know that it's very important to think about even if you regulate one compound or set a safety limit for one compound, if you have 10 different compounds with similar effect, and even if all of them are below the safety levels, 10 added together could lead to toxicological effects. So we need to th be thinking about those kind of things. And it's very difficult to regulate, put a policy in place, uh, but uh, we need to start thinking about it. And the scientist from the EPA is uh, actually the one who started all of this, the mi complex mixture. Um, so it, the science is there, and it's been a decade, and the more uh, data is coming up, uh, but we need to start. So, uh, is, so you're talking about uh, toxic compounds or the effects of, for example, plastic bottles. I mean, there's all this controversy as whether you should be drinking out of plastic bottles, right? Is that what you're talking about? I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring this down to our everyday lives. Can you, can you connect you it can there? You can get exposed to endocrine disruptor from, from plastic bottles. For instance. Uh, yeah, uh, plastic bottles, but also from perfume. There's phthalates contained in expensive perfume. Um, interesting. Um, the more expensive the perfume is, the more phthalate there is. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, um, 
there's, there's other compounds in the food packaging material. Benzophenone has been suggested to have some endocrine disrupting effects. BPA is a, a polyphenols. No, po yeah. Nonophenols. Nonophenols yeah. are uh, detergent um, and uh, found in ubiquitously in the environment. And also BPA is, uh, you probably have heard about that compound. But industry is, because of this pu public outcry, uh, the industry is starting to find a replacement for BPA. And there's a compound called BPS, which is as estrogenic as BPA, and there's some other uh, alternatives. So, uh, you know, Tosca should be able to regulate this com these compounds before it comes to the market. Um, and I think uh, industry should be held a little more responsible for their um, for which compound to use. Yeah, go ahead. Or just currently the way Tosca is written is that the onus is on the EPA to identify a problem. So uh, under a significant new use rule, the, when a company wants to use a new chemical or use it in a different way, they send a letter to the EPA and the EPA's got 90 days to require them to do something if they have significant justification. Uh, with 700 new chemicals each year, that's the two or three a day, um, the EPA just doesn't have the resources, and in Europe and Canada, that's not the way it's done. There, the, the onus is on the companies to provide supporting data that shows that the chemicals they will use are safe. And this just makes a lot of sense, especially when we're dealing with, you know, ACS, the American Chemical Society, for example. Obviously, small producers aren't going to be able to meet you know, the toxicological requirements, but in aggregate, uh, you know, our chemical society, our chemical manufacturers have the resources to to do this, to check to see how safe the products are that they are using, and really it provides them with an environment of certainty. That businesses don't like, I've been told, businesses don't like uncertainty and they don't like liability. And one of the best ways to create an environment for them where there's certainty and reduced liability is for them to know that they're using products that we know are safe. And so I think, you know, get, putting the onus on, on the companies to help participate in this process, I think, it's going to be a win-win in, in the long run. Margaret, in the, in the fiber science area, you must be encountering a lot of examples of, of this, uh, of um, the way we live and how chemical compounds are affecting our lives, so through clothes and so forth and so on. Can you, can you share with us some of your findings and so, uh, what do you, how do you see the problem? Um, so really that angle isn't what I was here to talk about today. Um, so I'll, I'll diverge a little ahead, bit from your question. Um, while Anthony and Matoko have kind of raised the alarm about all these chemicals being there and that companies need to be more responsible for identifying them, what I'd like to maybe pile on with is the fact that since the Tosca was, invent, uh, was first initiated in 1976, the ability to detect these compounds and the ability to find out what they're, how they're influencing human bodies has also advanced hugely. Um, for one thing, we've got huge amounts of computing power in all our pockets these days that really we didn't have in 1976. And researchers are starting to harness this as detectors for um, viruses and microbes and bacteria and other kind of bad actors. Um, additionally, what my research works on is um, making any of these detectors work better by concentrating and presenting um, and these things, these bacteria, these viruses coming out of an impure fluid. So whether you're starting with uh, groundwater, whether you're starting with um, sewer treatment plants, effluents, whether you're starting with chicken noodle soup or blood, um, you've got a whole lot of things in there and we need to find one or two of the toxic compound or the evidence of endocrine disruption um, there. And so what our research is able to do is gather that up, separate it, concentrate it, <clears throat> and then present it for detection. So in, in sum, what we're perhaps suggesting that industry needs to do is not unreasonable given the, the state of detection and what we're able to achieve on that front today. And we should remember that a lot of industries do already a huge amount of research into their products, a huge amount of quality control. 
So every time you maybe buy a bottle of shampoo that says, you know, increased shine, increased luster, increased body, they've actually gone through a lot of testing to prove that they've made a perceptible difference in that. So asking them to maybe do a little more testing and prove that they're not including something that's toxic doesn't seem uh, unreasonable. Um, meanwhile, in the, the textile industry, there's been, um, I guess a long history of looking at what's been added to uh, textiles and how they might be um, influencing <coughs> them in humans. One of the big uh, issues right now is adding fluorocarbons to, um, if anyone has stain repellent clothing, it's almost impossible right now to buy like, a, excuse me, a pair of men's pants that aren't stain repellent. Um, and that is basically done by grafting Teflon onto the cotton of the pants. So instead of, when you spill something on yourself, instead of soaking in and staining, it rolls and falls off, which is wonderful. It's, you know, it's delightful. Um, <laughs> That's a risk However, I'm willing to bear with. I, I'll take the chemical exposure for clean pants. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, fluorochemicals are another one that are, that that don't break down, they don't go away, they tend to bioaccumulate, and um, can build up and be harmful to humans. So um, research goes on, and even places like Cotton Incorporated, um, if you ever see the commercials that are the look, the feel of cotton, the fabric of our lives, you've seen those, right? They have people singing and dancing in their closet. Um, <laughs> see, I told you we were gonna get to dancing. <laughs> The, their um, research institute down in North Carolina um, actually is working on how to reduce the amount of uh, fluorochemicals, the amount of Teflon that's required to do that stain repellent and see if they can achieve that in less toxic kinds of ways. Stop beating up my microphone. Mm -hmm. So how is that? No, that's the, I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. Jump in. One of yeah, the yeah, points absolutely. I wanted to make was that you know, oftentimes, I, I've heard it said that the definition of a Cor Cornell professor is someone that believes otherwise. I, I believe otherwise. I believe you're wrong. And sometimes <laughs> I think uh, in academia we can just be seen to be uh, forecasting gloom and doom. But I think all of us, while we ident realize that, you know, there are significant problems out there, we're looking at for solutions from a practical standpoint. And, and I really was struck by Margaret's comments, just that you know, we, we're not just telling people that these chemicals are out there, but we're providing them with ways of either cleaning them up or making it easier for them to detect. And I think that's really one of the, the hallmarks of, of Cornell's approach is that we are the life sciences or the, the ag school to the world. And I think that's the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences thinks of it at, at, as the, of itself as that way, but that we're interested in not just identifying problems, but solving them. And uh, that's one of the, I think, the reasons it's so, so pleasurable to, to work with folks like this is that we come at it from many different angles, and it's really a, a great opportunity to, to look for the opportunities to, to interact with one another. So, so uh, just to, to share a little bit of your day with, uh, with our audience, uh, did, how was your message received? Did you get anything out of the conversations that uh, was, that was unexpected or reassuring or gave you gave you pause? I'm not giving you any. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I was struck with how young the interns were. They all looked like <laughs> sophomores, and um, but I was really I was I was enthused at their um, their drive. They want to know what can we do, and so that was really refreshing. And that there is there are things that they can do. It's a little um, unnerving to know that really. The, the catalysts driving the policy change are these 21-year-old kids that are there for the summer, but they're able to cross boundaries. I was told that no one from the House would show up because we were in the Senate side of the building, yet we had kids that were working with representatives from the House, and it was great to see, okay, and you could see the wheels turning. What, what can we do? And that was actually you know, one of the questions, what, what can we do? And so for me, that was one of the most beneficial um, parts of the interaction. Yes, they were there to learn. They wanted to know exactly how, what nuances they could perhaps spin on. I think I heard the term messaging several times. Um, but it was done, it was presented with the notion that they're trying to solve problems. And so that, for me, that was great. I really appreciated that. Antonio, did you hear anything uh, you'd like to share? 
I, I agree. I, I had a very good impression of they, they were genuinely interested and they wanted to know whether this Tosca reform is going to do the job that they want. Uh, so I was very pleased to see uh, young people think that way and interested in the subject and concerned about toxic compounds as well. I think I was also very encouraged that they asked some tough questions about if we're all presenting this as kind of a no-brainer, why is there disagreement? And why is there disagreement on both edges, um, maybe from chemical industry and maybe from um, environmentalists, both? And I think Anthony responded that that, that meant we're, we're getting there, that we're getting to a good point with this. If you know, the extreme edges are, are both kind of not liking it, then maybe we're kind of getting to the If everybody's the equally point. unhappy. If everyone's we're, equally we're, unhappy. We're doing our job. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point, I'd like, to, I'd like to invite you to ask your questions. Um, who would like to go first? Please. I have a question about the jeans I'm wearing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> they look great. Actually, that was more of a joke, but is, is that, um, are, are basic things? Is there stain stuff in everything? Um, some some denim jeans do have stain repellents on them. Um, with the, I mean, there's a lot of things you can talk about with with denim jeans. Um, you know, from the cotton and how the cotton is grown to the dyeing processes and whether that's done. You know, if we did it in this country, we couldn't just release the dyes into the rivers. Um, but in other countries, that's not necessarily true. And dye pollution is very easy to identify because all of a sudden your river is a different color. Um, to, the, to even the labor standards that are required to you know, make the clothing as, as cheap as we want to buy it for. So um, you can tell, uh, if you want to test your jeans and see if they're stain repellent, go ahead and dump. Go get a glass of red wine and dump <laughs> on there and if it, beads up and rolls off, you'll know you've got some good stain repellents. If not, um, Tide. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike most experiments where we encourage you not to try these things at home, we, we suggest you try this at home, not <laughs> Okay. Um, but so, but I mean, I think the point of, his, of the question is just how ubiquitous this problem is. I mean, we're, we're endlessly confronted by those 84,000 compounds, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe I can speak to that. I mean, we work on um, degrading antimicrobial compounds, triclosan, and it's almost impossible to find a hand soap that doesn't contain an antimicrobial compound, triclosan being one of the, the worst offenders. It's accumulating in fish. Um, it impacts our own immune systems. Um, it's in t toothpaste at 3,000 parts per million. And um, yet it, it really has no, statistically, no beneficial effect. I, I remember reading some of the early studies and the jargon, you could tell that the paper had been through the company um, legal department because instead of saying there was no effect, they said not significantly different can, than control, which meant legal ease for no effect. So here we have, we're, we're putting compounds into our lives that aren't really having the effect that they're intended for, and yet they're used as a marketing ploy. And when we uh, wrote on this subject, we, we talked about this idea, this mentality of the microbophobic po public, that sometimes the products we consume are marketed to our fears. And so being a good consumer, being a wise consumer to say, okay, what am I buying? Am I buying a product that has something that I really need or maybe I don't? Um, where are these products manufactured? Are, um, Maquila Dori is where many blue jeans are manufactured north in uh, northern Mexico. They're, they have a problem there with blue earth. The water is so blue because they don't have the environmental standards uh, that when they actually are watering the, the land, that the land turns blue. Um, it, it's quite striking, and so the, you know the everyday products we do consume can have an effect not just on us, but also affect uh, environments uh, half a world away or just across the border. Yes, thank you for coming. Yes, thank you for coming. Uh, I live in a town where. Still uh, I live in a town where a group of people have I, Just speak Asian up louder. Don't worry about the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I live in a town where a group of people have introduced a municipal ordinance to ban pesticides. 
Uh, they've created a list of pesticides, uh, including uh, glyphosate, otherwise known as Roundup, and a number of other pesticides that they refer to as cosmetic lawn pesticides, and have introduced this legislation in our municipal government, and it's become uh, quite divisive, as you, uh, you might expect. Uh, our mayor has estimated that he'd have to hire a full-time employee just to implement this legislation. Uh, on the other hand, I've been asked a question as to how do you sample for pesticides? And is there a litmus paper where you can swipe the lawn and figure out where the pesticides are? Well, no. Uh, so what is your take on the uh, utility of an approach that does this at the local level as opposed to does, does this at the state level or the national level? in terms of management of pesticides? <laughs> I guess um, I had one project where we've worked on controlled release of pesticides to try and make sure that every amount of pesticide that's used actually goes to the, the use rather than being blown away or running off the land. And I will say I'm a big fan of Roundup. This <laughs> much easier than weed whacking. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think there's a valid uh, concern, especially about, you know, overuse or maybe uh, extreme use of, of pesticides um, for lawns and also for, for crops. It does seem really tough, I guess, to me. Well, I guess the estimates from, uh, I've heard from Cornell Entomology is that about a 30% of what's applied actually does the job and the, uh, the rest of it kind of um, you know, gets blown away in the air, gets into the water system, and is in places where it's doing, having a negative impact instead of a positive impact. So you know, I think the concern is real and the concern is valid. Whether this approach would make any um, material difference or actually even improve the, the health and the water of that town, um, I'm kind of skeptical. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea of home rule as far as being able to set ordinances that are specific to one location. Whether or not the ordinance that passed or it's being considered in your location is going to do what it's intended to do, I, I don't know. But, um, but uh, really one example where this has helped to drive uh, greater understanding of chemicals in the environment is really California's approach to regulating. California has said EPA is not either not enforcing Tosco or is not using it to its full extent and is not regulating chemicals that n are known to be harmful. For, so California has not waited around for the EPA to come up with legislation. In the 30, what, 37 years since Tosca has been enacted, only five chemicals have been banned. And of those, one was rescinded by court order. So Tosca has laid the groundwork for helping us understand how we can manage chemicals, but its implementation, really the EPA has been handcuffed. So I think if one of the important things to do is to remain involved in your community so that your voice is heard and so that legislation that does come about represents the broad array of, of opinions because we see this in hydrofracking in upstate New York. Hydrofracking, while still not, there's a moratorium at the state level, but municipalities have come together and said we, under the New York's home rule um, legislation, we have decided that we don't want it in our neighborhood. And so that creates the opportunity for people to be involved and to feel ownership. I think one of the problems is that <coughs> legislation is a very slow moving beast and it's not responsive to the needs of individual communities. So while I can understand your frustration perhaps that um, this might be overly restrictive, in general, I think it's great, and what it means is if we're seeing legislation in our communities that it isn't representative of our views, it's a great opportunity for us to get involved and make sure our voices are heard. A uh, question about uh, your position on Tosca. I've unfortunately been practicing Tosca law for since 1976. Um, <laughs> are you supporting the uh, Lautenberg bill? Is that your position? As a Cornell employee, I am not supporting anything. Uh, personally, I, I would refer you, for anybody that's interested in, re in reading uh, cogent arguments about what needs to change in Tosca, GAO has a great article, that, testimony that they presented to Congress in 2009 that I think identifies the problems. So I would personally be in favor of any bill that addresses those issues. So, so 
issues specifically are giving EPA the greater authority to mandate testing, to require information. So currently, I've talked to people in the chemical industry, and they tell me that they don't want to know anything about the chemical they're using because anything they know they have to share with the EPA. But they're not required to generate any information if they don't already have it. Yeah, well, uh, you sort of had one thing wrong in your discussion. Okay, please. Because uh, with respect to new chemicals, uh -huh. EPA does have the upper hand. There is no mandatory data requirement, but they can basically require whatever they want. And in fact, Latin Book Bill does virtually nothing Agreed. to change the new chemical substance to, hmm. uh, system because nobody thinks that's broken. Some of the other things you identified are clearly broken and need to be fixed. But the new chemical clearance process, nobody has said there's any problem. And um, there's really no point to generating hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of toxicology data as a requirement for a chemical that's going to be used in limited quantities. It's critical to making your iPhone. Its residues are incinerated because that's the rule they write when they write the limited volume exemption. And you know, why do you need a million dollars of toxicology for a chemical that virtually nobody is exposed to? And that's what works in Tosca now. That's not changed. But don't confuse that. Well, <laughs> it does need to be changed. Sure. No, I would, but I would disagree that there is some disagreement with the, at EPA as to whether or not that works because the onus is, is on them to require the information and to, and to identify a potential risk. And so they are still under, you know, they're understaffed and, and there's limitations on their ability to come up with, I mean, the bar is fairly high for what they have to, how they justify requiring additional information. Not for you, Kim. Mm. Existing chemicals, I'm 100% yeah. right, but not new chemicals. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll disagree. Not a DMN system. Okay. I'm, uh, coming, I'm coming to you right away, but there's a gentleman right here who's been waiting. Yeah, I'm just going to comment on, on this uh, TOSCA business. I, I worked in the office of EPA that implements TOSCA, that administers TOSCA for 27 years. In fact, the first job I had when I got to EPA from Monsanto was to uh, create a risk assessment about new chemicals. The, at, that, at that point, the Chemical Manufacturers Association had a petition in the EPA saying um, that for um, a small volume chemicals, which I think was 10,000 kilograms, it's still there. slightly limited intermediates in polymers, but they didn't have to submit anything. They just automatically, if they submitted information that the chemical, new chemical was going to be in one of those three classes, no problem. So my job was do a risk assessment on an unknown chemical with unknown toxicity for unknown uses to support some kind of restriction on what, what they can get away with. And I, 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 what we created was enough so that the industry finally you know, executed an MOU saying, well, we will not submit for exemption anything that has any structural similarity to a carcinogen, a, a reproductive toxicant, in a couple of other categories. Uh, but on the other, on the other side of the uh, coin here, uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Identicide Act gives the agency authority to require specific testing before any chemical can be used. And so that is, I think, is the, is the basically the model that, that you're basically talking about. That for, for chemicals that are going to be, uh, uh, have wide exposure, uh, to, to give the uh, uh, agency the authority to require a, a battery of tests similar to what FIFRA uh, now uh, stipulates. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, working in EPA has been, been very interesting. Thanks for your service at EPA. I just did just returning briefly, so I agree that exemptions for chemicals that we never see, if there's no exposure, there's no risk. And so, and one of the arguments that GAO makes that I think is really cogent is that we should be regulating chemicals that are coming to market and really not focusing so much on, on experimental chemicals, these low volume chemicals that aren't really, where we're not exposing people. And I think one of our missions here is to educate the general public where there is no risk, where there is no exposure, there is no risk. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't share that information with you. Everything is toxic, there's nothing that's not. What's really, what really matters is what are we actually getting exposed to? And if we can 
We can manage risk in a number of different ways. We can pr prevent production of chemicals, but that's really not the most useful approach. The best way is just to limit exposure, and there are a number of ways that we can do that. I definitely agree with you on that subject. Would you like to? Yes, please, go ahead. Um, I was wondering what, uh, if you have any suggestions for ways for people to limit their exposure, like if there are things like that are they're put into our clothing that we don't even know because it's not, you know, if it's not every item of clothing says that it's made with Teflon. Are there words or uh, things that you can look for in the store to avoid, you know, buying chemicals that, that have unknown effects on your health? <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, it's hard to give a short answer to that. We've um, got all evening. The test isn't for another 20 minutes. The test isn't for another 20 minutes. Yeah, so I, you know, I think having some um, maybe awareness of, of uh, how things are, where, are made, as it's become more important to know maybe where your food is coming from, um, there's some argument that it's becoming more important to know uh, where your clothing is coming from. Um, the, I'm almost regretting bringing up the, the stain repellents as an example now. While they're, you know, while they're bound to your clothes, they're not really hazardous to you. Um, when they become free and get into the water system, then, then they do become hazardous. So, um, you know, some years ago workers at DuPont who were making the, the chemical actually filed a suit against DuPont to be, you know, because they were having effects of this kind of material. Um, so, what do I have to say about this? I would say, you know, you have an iPhone, Google it. Um, yep. That's my answer to, to most questions that I get. But look, at, if there's a name brand or if there's a, a micro brand, for example, or if, it's, if it says something that implies that it's got some sort of protective capability, then th I think that's when I start asking questions. I wonder, okay, what is this stuff? Um, one of the studies we did a few years ago, we, we got contacted by an insider who worked for Whirlpool Hot Tubs, and he was concerned that they were putting triclosan, which is this antimicrobial compound, into their hot tub plastics, and he wanted to know, was it going to leach? He really didn't like the idea of it. And so we, we looked at those plastics, and one of the things that we went shopping, we just went to the store, and we started buying things that we found triclosan in, in dish towels, we found it in hand soaps, we found it in cotton swabs. And when we looked, you know, and some of these materials it leached from very readily, others it didn't. And so I think if there's, from, you know, what I tell my mom is if, it, if there's something in there that you don't recognize, do a little bit of research. Just because something has a long chemical name doesn't mean it's a problem. But uh, with the freedom of information availability these days, I think we can pr very quickly get an idea of what is actually in the products that we're going to buy, and then you can make an informed decision from there. But, but I, I definitely don't want to generate a, my, uh, chemical phobia because chemicals are important. Lots of them do important things for us and our beverage. And I think the, the point that you're also trying to drive home is you want to know more. You want to, you want to do more research on these things and their interactions among themselves so that uh, there's a more educated approach to all this, right? Sure. Right. So some questions over here? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Phil Caruso. I'm a proud former student of Dr. Price. Uh, I'm an Afghanistan veteran, and one of the most significant uh, chemical exposure issues affecting my generation of veterans is the use of incinerators and burn pits in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, to consume hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of polyethylene paraphthalate uh, water bottles, amongst other things, uh, that then create um, particulate matter and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon and polybrominated and polychlorinated dioxins. Uh, that at least one and a half million of our veterans, in addition to hundreds of thousands of uh, our uh, allies, veterans, um, and millions of other local people in those areas are then exposed to. Uh, I've got a couple questions. First being, uh, this is a controversial issue. Uh, what do you see as being the uh, true risks associated with these environments? Um, and is there a precedent upon which uh, we can deal with this issue and uh, prevent it from happening again? <laughs> okay, Why don't you take a, take a stab at it? So dioxin is, you know, some of those uh, compounds are, they generally define as dioxins, and it's really hard to get rid of it from the environment once you have it. 
and it could be generated by simple incineration above a certain temperature, uh, below a certain temperature. If you have chlorine compounds and uh, some benzene, th then you get dioxin-like comp compounds. So it's really a um, tough one to solve. And do you have any? Well, what, one of the things I know that's going on at Cornell is developing better combustion technology. Small, easily deployed, um, both at Su Cornell and at SUNY, easily deployed. Um, basically ovens that will allow us to burn these things because Matoko's right, there are engineering controls that can take care of this. Uh, we no longer generate a lot of dioxins from commercial smokestacks because we realize what the fluke temperature conditions need to be like, what the moisture content and what the, the chlorine content need to be like. Uh, as far, as late as the 1990s, 40 percent of the dioxins that were generated in the United States were generated from backyard burning. So sort of these, and whether it's plastics or whether it's right. just regular trash, you know, coming up with engineering controls I think is great and one of the other advantages to that is that you're really using resources to generate electricity so it's a win-win in many situations and so I know folks at Cornell are, are addressing that not necessarily from the toxicology first aspect but certainly there are additional benefits from a toxicological approach um, that come from using green technology and this is again plugged for the Atkinson Center where you're bringing together people that are working in mechanical engineering to develop n new stoves or new ovens with people from toxicology to, to look at the effects of the byproducts is a great opportunity to be able to address some of these really important emerging concerns. And thanks for your service, by the way. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll jump on that I'm sure you remember from your class that those bottles can also be uh, recycled. So they don't necessarily need to be fully incinerated but the PET from the bottles can be made directly into uh, polyester fibers that are like the fibers we, polyester fibers in our clothing. And that's really um, a matter of creating a value stream for that. Um, since the starting material is oil, the more expensive oil becomes to make polyester, the raw material is, is oil, petroleum. Uh, the more expensive that becomes, the more uh, economically viable it becomes to gather up those bottles and recycle those as a raw material instead. So, but of course that requires infrastructure. I guess all of these solutions kind of require that, which may also be completely lacking in these uh, conditions. So it's definitely a, a tough problem. And aren't the microbiologists uh, developing these uh, biodegradation by microbes as well? So that's one alternative. Sure. I mean, for Once those those long-term exposures, yeah. microbes can be brought to bear with. But minimizing again, it's a question of how do you minimize exposure. So one way is to you know, get a, get away from open burn pits, for example, making sure that we're using low-tech, easily deployed devices that can harness that energy, burn it, produce rec or recover um, energy that can be used to charge batteries or do other things in the field. That, that these are the types of technologies that I think are really going to be protective of human health in those types of environments. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I think you have yeah, the mic at the I moment. Have, I have a couple really quick questions. One is, um, are there resources for the consumer where they can find what is settled science? In other words, and I'll give an example in terms of EPA. Um, I do my best to avoid canned foods that may have EPA. But then a couple months ago, I heard that cash register receipts have EPA, which I get every day, have in my pocketbook and in my pocket. Am I supposed to now avoid that? I mean, that's just one example. But my question is, you know, what is a consumer to do? We could go on Google and Google different chemicals, et cetera, but are there resources that you all would recommend where you can really find uh, where there's been evidence-based research and there's settled science this is proven as harmful, and you can be sure that if you avoid this, you're avoiding one more contaminants. So maybe maybe something that could be very useful, and we can do this as a follow-up to some of these specific questions, is uh, maybe I can collect from you all some resources on the web that we can then share with you by email, um, so that so you can follow up uh, and then find answers to this. Because obviously. Uh, it's kind of hard here to find solutions to every specific problem. But I think that uh, what, what I'm hearing here is that the, the chemicals you, you're interested in studying are showing up in everybody's lives in every way. So do you want to take a, 
uh, beyond sharing some information after? Do you have some additional thoughts you want no, to add? I think that's a great idea. There are, okay. there are, are websites that I trust, and I'd be happy to share those yeah. links with you. But there's not one clearinghouse. I mean, uh, the National Institutes of Environmental Health and Safety have some information. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has some. Um, and the Europeans also have a number of sites that I, I, are trusted. But I agree, being a, a wise consumer of information is hard, even for those of us that are working in this field. And so I, I sense the frustration that you're, you're expressing there. And I think this is one of those things that we need to be able to address. Is, and this is part of TOSCA is for regulation. Part of TOSCA is also for um, communication. So the toxic release inventory is involved in letting people know what chemicals are used where. And so there's, you know, there are laws that we can use better to keep people informed. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Quick uh, toxicity question. I think what you guys are doing is great. It's um, dealing with, though, you haven't touched on one area that um, I've been researching, and which is in EMFs, electromagnetic field pollution. Uh, they're talking like the Bio uh, Initiative uh, report. Uh, Martin Blank at Columbia, <laughs> uh, a lot of information about above two, two milligauss, it starts to produce cancer and so forth. And I'm wondering if that's going to eventually come into this dialogue or your program, because we have physics yeah. and engineering. And so on. Have you have any thoughts about that? I have no comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just outside of my well, area of expertise, but it is a very interesting question. Great. Go ahead, sir. I have a comment and, and, a, and a question. Um, the, this, the general thesis is avoid exposure to the, uh, any, any event for any chemical. Um, I've done a lot of work in this field on environmental attorneys, so I have to deal with these risks all the time in the last over, over decades. My impression is the, the research on BPA and phthalates and a number of other things, uh, to say the least, the, the, the science is not there. A lot of people believe that BPA has been approved by other countries and FDA and, uh, and uh, other international organizations over many years, and the, the testing that underlies the potential concerns about phthalates and BPA and, and some other things um, are talking about the results in test tubes. There's a big difference between a result in a test tube and, and an effect in a person, and there's a level of effect of the person. I can be a little bit drowsy, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's an adverse effect. So it's not free to do these things that we're talking about here to avoid those exposures. So science is required. So the question is, what adverse evidence do we have to, to avoid things like BPA in, 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 a, in, a, in a plastic drinking bottle? You know, my wife just banned all the BPA plastics in my house. <laughs> that works. <laughs> what science has she done that I don't know about? But, but, but uh, what, what science is in there in BPA that causes us to spend this additional money, and it'd be a lot of additional money, to take BPA out of cans which are now used to avoid botulism. For you as a middle-aged white male, we're, run, we're not concerned about you. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't take it personally. But So what we're really worried, and so I personally am not overly concerned about BPA in my life, but uh, unborn children, um, pregnant women. So these are the sensitive point, the sensitive populations that uh, w we need to be focusing our legislation on because in many cases, exposures and the timing of exposure are what's really critical, and that's what makes the, the research difficult to do. And so we're looking at reproductive endpoints, and yes, can, um, I disagree, but the evidence is lacking there too. Well, I guess it, one of the things that we need to do as consumers is to look who's funding what research and what are the outcomes. So 75% of all statistics are made up, is what I've heard, but 75% uh, <laughs> of outcomes seems to, be gener seems to correlate well with funding source. And so we need to be skeptical of who's funding what, what the outcomes are. Um, with the, you know, I'm not going to speak specifically to BPA, but I think just being wise consumers of information and realizing that there are concerns, but minimizing chemical exposure to, exposure to everything just isn't possible. So just managing the risks and realizing, okay, who are the sensitive populations? Who do we need to worry about? I think that's the, the more rational approach that we need to take. And one last question. Hi. This is in my field, but um, I have read on it a bit. And I guess uh, the precautionary principle operates in Europe and in Canada and would say 
if we think it's going to be harmful, well, then we should stop it because we, it will be a long time before we move beyond the test tube. Um, what are your thoughts, or perhaps this is more for a, a lobbyist political analyst than you all, but what are the chances of getting more of the precautionary principle into TSCA? I, I guess I would like to also see it operating at the FDA, but um, it doesn't seem to grow the cannabis, so, but I'm now missing <laughs> Good question, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the slides that I showed um, the folks on, on the Hill today was about the, the dropping levels of um, mercury regulations, or basically over the last 25 years, the level of harm for mercury has dropped 30-fold. So we know now that levels that we thought were safe 30 years ago are not safe anymore. And part of, I think, the answer to your question is empowering the EPA to make regulatory law without requiring statutory revision so that they can use the best science to come up with, with um, levels or uh, recommended daily allowances or whatever it is, so that they're not dependent on ch you know, whoever is in power at any given time to come up with a, a law that gives them the power. So empowering EPA to do science-based um, limit, regulatory limit setting, I think, is the answer there. Um, and by doing that, we allow the precautionary principle to to be incorporated into the, the, the regulatory process. And uh, also to point out, in, in order to employ those precautionary principles, we need alternatives, safer alternatives. And right now, I think the funding is not uh, going, or the effort to, of the government is not going so much for creating these alternatives, safe alternatives, but focusing on does EPA or phthalates have really toxicology effect and spending a lot of money on it. Um, but what we should instead be doing, if there is suspect that it could be doing those harmful effect, effects in humans, we should be starting to look for alternatives. And instead of just replacing with BPS and other um, similar um, toxic chemicals, we should be really looking for those real, really safe chemicals. So that's where we should be focusing on. Thank you, Matoko. Margaret, do you have a one, last? One, one last that? quick sure, go ahead. comment about the, about the problem with Tosca. I think has, has been historically the plasticity of the unreasonable risk threshold. Yes. Uh, sometimes mm. it's high and sometimes it's low. Yes. And that's, that's been a real big problem for the agency, especially when they get to court. Right. Yes. So I, I think this is where simply rewording the legislation would be powerful. Reasonable and customary would be, and GAO makes a, a, an argument in, the, in this case. I mean, that's what led to the, the court demand the overturn of the legislation with asbestos because that legal definition was out of sync with the scientific definition. So making sure those are in sync and that the legislation is worded in a way to capture that will be a powerful tool. There's some environmental lawyers who would differ with. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I. I know the current. Have to know the I know the current uh, bill kept that unreasonable risk. So, so there, unless right. there's clear the definition of what unreasonable risk is going to be, we still would have problems, even if this right. bill is goes through. Even if it goes through. Yeah. Right. Margaret, do you have any last thoughts? Um, you know, I guess we're always weighing the, you know, the risks and the benefits of using different chemicals against each other. And when there's a push, um, again, you know, my background is more in the textile industry, and that industry over the years has moved away from using a lot of different kinds of toxic chemicals to moving to using more naturally occurring materials like enzymes. Um, to do the same processes, and so being moving away from doing things in uh, toxic solvents to now doing it in water with enzymes in it. So, you know, I, I guess I think with with the proper motivation and drive, it's not necessarily that we have to give up all the benefits and that we can't reduce the toxicity of the things around us. But always, those things are in some sort of balance. So um, thank you very much. Uh, this, this has been an enlightening hour, and thank you for all your questions. Um, clearly, we're not going to settle this completely, but hopefully, we've, uh, hopefully you all have made, had some impact today in moving the, the argument forward for, for good regulation, in effect. And um, 
And, uh, and I would uh, think that you would, would like to join me in thanking Margaret and Motoko and, um, and uh, Anthony for, for, for being here with us today. Is, these are researchers who matter. And uh, we're going to be working to bring, bring them back and bringing some of their colleagues here. Uh, and as part of our effort uh, that I was describing a little bit earlier, uh, some of my colleagues tomorrow will be doing focus groups with uh, alumni to get a, a good sense of uh, what's on your mind and what do you think about these efforts and so forth and so on. And so please uh, let us know what you think. Um, we thrive in university communications and my colleagues in other parts of the, the university in understanding what's of interest to you and so that we can uh, bring our colleagues to you to have these kinds of conversations. So thank you for your participation. <laughs>